capital of the region of Emilia Romagna, and this is an ideal destination either as a city getaway or part of a greater trip around Italy. Strolling through its lively streets, you come across a charming mix of history, delicious flavours and long-standing traditions which create an ideal setting for enjoying life's simple pleasures. This delightful Italian city goes by a trio of fascinating nicknames, each revealing a unique aspect of its charm. La Dotta means the learned and salutes Bologna's brilliant intellect as host to the Western world's oldest university. La Grassa, the fat, celebrates this city's status as a gastronomic haven. And La Rossa, the red, beckons the city's warm, welcoming terracotta colored buildings and it's a nod to its left-leaning politics. The name La Grassa La Dota was already in circulation in the 12th century. Following World War II, Italians added another element to the nickname La Rossa, which referred to Bologna's status as the stronghold of Italy's Communist Party, whose symbol is the colour red. As a result, the complete nickname became La Grassa La Dota La Rossa. And now let's go and explore and experience the wonderful things to do in Bologna. Andiamo, let's go! Ciao e benvenuti! Hello and welcome! My name is Michelle, I'm the Intrepid Guide, your guide to language learning all by using my unique 80-20 method. For daily Italian lessons and tips, follow me on Instagram at Intrepid Italian or visit IntrepidItalian.com to find out more about my online language courses with lifetime access. Bologna is a true gem of Italian culture known primarily for its vibrant food scene. However, this city's significance extends far beyond gastronomy, as it served as a centre of trade, arts and politics since ancient times. Moreover, Bologna is home to the world's oldest university, making it a magnet for history lovers and culture enthusiasts. Bologna's history can be traced to a tiny village that was established in the 11th century BC at the base of the Bolognese Hills. However, things took off only in the 6th century BC with the arrival of the Etruscans, known for their expertise and capabilities. They named it Felsina, which may have derived from the Etruscan term for fertile land. And without a doubt, Bologna did thrive for centuries to come. Various people have taken control of Bologna throughout its history, but the city has never forgotten its Etruscan heritage. In fact, the locals still proudly call themselves Felsine to honour their ancient roots. In 189 BC, the Romans conquered Bologna and transformed it into a Roman colony named Bononia. The term Bona actually means good in Latin. Under Roman rule, the city's importance and wealth grew, with Bononia becoming one of the wealthiest cities in the area. The famous Via Emilia, a road built by the consul Marcus Aemilius Lepidus in 187 BC, symbolises Bologna's significance. Today, the road is known as the SS9 Via Emilia. Over time, Bologna's legal status changed from a colony to a municipality, and locals were granted Roman citizenship in 88 BC. Under Emperor Augustus, Bologna continued to develop with the construction of an underground aqueduct that still functions perfectly today. At the end of the Roman Empire, barbarians constantly attacked Bologna, leaving it a mere shadow of its former glory. Following such destruction, the Christian bishop Petronius, who later became the city's patron saint, started rebuilding the city centre and laid the foundation for the magnificent San Petronio Basilica that still stands proudly. Bologna was then ruled by various powers, including the Goths, the Byzantines and the Lombards, until it was eventually given to the Pope by Charlemagne. Then in the 11th century, the city became one of the first free communes in Italy, which was a significant turning point in its history. As a result, Bologna experienced significant economic and cultural growth, leading to a new era of prosperity that lasted for years to come. During this exciting time, many stunning buildings sprang up around Bologna, some of which still grace the skyline today. In the 11th century, Bologna was surrounded by its defensive walls, but with the growing population of university students arriving into the city, they couldn't build outwards nor outside the safety of the city walls. The solution? They extended the upper floors of existing buildings, which extended over the street level below. This created a network of porticos all over the city, the clever solution also meant that you didn't need to pay additional taxes since you didn't occupy public space. Unfortunately for the owners, this tax break ended in 1288 when the municipality made porticos mandatory for every building where streets were wide enough to accommodate them. 
Today they are an iconic expression of Bologna's history and urban identity. In 2006, UNESCO crowned Bologna as a creative city of music and again a second time as a World Heritage Site in 2021 for its impressive network of porticos. Covering a total stretch of 62 kilometres, some of the porticos are built of wood, others of stone or brick, as well as reinforced concrete covering roads, squares, paths and pathways, either on one or both sides of the street. There is even written evidence that the first porticos date from 1041. The crowning glory of all these porticos is the 3.79 km walkway that connects the centre of Bologna with the Madonna di San Luca sanctuary, located on the hilltop. With 666 arches and 15 chapels along the route, it holds the record for the longest covered arcade in the world. Built in 1562, the Archiginnasio of Bologna is one of the most important buildings in the city of Bologna and was once the main building of the university. The University of Bologna is Europe's oldest university and the oldest in the Western world. Over nine centuries, it has amassed numerous valuable artifacts, including the world's oldest Torah, written between 1155 and 1225. Established in 1088, long before the university had one main location six centuries later, the university had various locations scattered around the city and lessons were held at home, in people's houses, often the professors or even inside a church. People came from all over Europe to study here and by the 12th century the population of Bologna grew to 60,000 people. Only Paris and Milan had 60,000 inhabitants at this time, but Bologna was much smaller, with less than 400 square kilometres, bound by its city walls. The first faculty, or subject, offered was jurisprudence, meaning the study, knowledge or science of law. In 1562, the Archiginnasio building was commissioned by a member of the famous Florentine family, the Medici. He was also the Pope, and we can see decorations of this and the papal coat of arms on the building. This features the papal hat and two keys. Pope Pius IV, who was born Giovanni Angelo Medici, decided to establish this one building for the university, bringing together all of its students. This was split into two parts one for the majority of students who were law students, and the other part was for students of the liberal arts. The outside of the palace has a long portico of 30 arches. Divided into two floors around a central courtyard, two wide staircases lead up to the upper floor, which has 10 classrooms and two lecture halls at the end of the building, one for the artists and one for the lawyers. The galleries, the walls of the rooms and the staircases are all decorated with inscriptions and celebratory monuments of the professors of the university and approximately 6,000 coat of arms of students, the largest collection of heraldic wall ornaments in existence. From 1563 until 1803, this was the headquarters of the university until Napoleon came along and changed this building into a public library in 1838. Also, here you will find the stunning anatomical theatre, where students of medicine could study anatomy through the dissection of human cadavers, starting from the 17th century. The room was designed by Bolognese architect Antonio Paolucci in 1637, and called teatro, meaning theatre, due to its characteristic shape of this amphitheatre. Constructed in pinewood, the anatomical theatre features two decorative rows of statues. On the bottom are 12 famous physicians, and on the top are 20 of the most famous anatomists of the University of Bologna. The ceiling is decorated with symbolic figures, representing 14 constellations. At the centre is Apollo, patron deity of medicine. The chair of the lecture, which overlooks that of the demonstrator, is flanked by two statues, called the Skinned. Sculpted in 1734 on a design by Ercole Lelli, a famous modeler of the Institute of the Sciences. Above the canopy is a seated feminine figure, who receives a flower as an homage from a winged cherub, but it is actually a femur bone. The anatomical theatre suffered serious damages during a bombardment on January 29, 1944, which destroyed this wing of the building. The theatre was reconstructed immediately after the war, reusing the original wood sculptures that were recovered from the ruins. Did you know that Italy has more leaning towers than just the iconic one that you'll find in Pisa? Well, in Bologna, you'll find that there aren't just one, but two remarkable leaning towers. 
The taller of the two even surpasses the height of Pisa's most famous bell tower. Located in Piazza di Porta Ravegnana are the Azinelli and Garisenda Towers. But how did they get here, and what were they used for? In medieval times, Bologna's skyline was broken up by over 100 towers, similar to these. Even though Bologna was surrounded and protected by its own defensive city walls in the Middle Ages, the richest families who could afford to have their own tower began building these very tall towers in case of assault or civil war. This practice became highly competitive, with affluent families each striving to construct the loftiest tower to showcase their power and wealth. They varied in height from 20 metres, or 65 feet, and 60 metres, 197 feet. But by the 16th century, the torri, or towers, had fallen out of fashion. Fire and the fear of collapse were constant hazards, and the great palazzi took over as the main status symbols of noble families. In the 19th century, during urban regeneration, many of the surviving towers were demolished. Many of those that remain tend to tilt, often at alarming angles. The Azzoguidi Tower, also known as Alta Bella, aka the Tall Beauty, is the only one that stands perfectly vertical. The most famous towers, however, and symbols of the city are the Azinelli and the Garisenda, also known as the Twin Towers, or Le Due Torri in Italian. As with all towers, their names derive from the families who constructed them. These towers were constructed between 1109 and 1119, taking about 10 years each to build. Originally, both of these towers were 60 metres high, but after the Garisenda started to lean, it was lowered 12 metres for safety reasons. The Azinelli was bought by the municipality of Bologna and chosen to be the main watchtower thanks to its central position in the city and now stands at 97.2 metres tall. Today, the Azinelli Tower is open to visitors for a breathtaking bird's eye view of Bologna. 498 steps later, this is where we are. Booking is essential and tickets sell out fast, so to avoid disappointment, make sure you book well in advance. For more details and to book your visit, I've included a link in the description below. As we learned earlier from the city's nickname, which includes La Grassa, the fat, we know that the Bolognesi take their food very seriously. In 1972, the Academy of Italian Cuisine decreed that the exact width of a cooked strand of tagliatelle pasta must be 1 1270th of the height of the Azinelli Tower. That's roughly 8 to 9 millimeters thick. Torre Prendiparte is another majestic tower that's withstood the test of time. This tower once served as a stronghold for the influential Prendiparte family or clan and has functioned as a defensive fortress and a somber prison with inscriptions from prisoners still visible. Standing at an impressive 60 metres tall, it is the second tallest tower in Bologna after the Azinelli. Today you can climb its 12 floors to reach the panoramic terrace for stunning panoramic views of the city. Or if you fancy having the tower all to yourself, you can book an overnight stay here. There is a bedroom, kitchen and a living area, but be warned though, the price and the climb to the top are not for the faint-hearted. For more details, check out the link in the description below. Located in front of the Archiginnasio is Piazza Luigi Galvani, where a monument stands to commemorate the works and findings of Luigi Galvani, an Italian physician, physicist and biologist from Bologna. In 1780, he observed that the legs of a dissected frog twitched when they came into contact with certain metals, particularly brass. He initially believed that this phenomenon, known as animal electricity, originated from within the frog itself. He theorized that the muscles of the frog contained an innate electrical fluid that was activated by the contact with metal. Galvani's work laid the foundation for the discovery of bioelectricity and the understanding of nerve impulses. It's from Luigi Galvani that we get the term galvanize, which has come to be associated with the application of electric current to stimulate muscle activity or to cover metal with a protective layer. The capital of the Emilia-Romagna region is an absolute delight for anyone who loves good food, with a variety of succulent dishes that earned it the nickname La Grassa, the fat. From homemade pasta to mouth-watering cured meats, food is taken seriously around here. Many recipes are even registered at the local Chamber of Commerce to preserve their authenticity. As the clock strikes lunchtime, there's no better place to be than Bologna's quadrilatero, meaning quadrilateral. 
due to the four-sided shape of this neighborhood that's nestled between Via Rizzoli, Via del Archiginnasio, Via Farini and Via Castiglione. This is home to Bologna's famous market with the craft, mercantile and trading tradition dating back to the Middle Ages. Wandering through the winding alleys, you'll discover a labyrinth of streets bearing the names of the artisans and tradespeople who've plied their craft here for centuries. As you stroll, be sure to stop by the legendary Osteria del Sole, the oldest tavern in town where patrons bring their own food to accompany their excellent wine on offer. Another key stop is Mercato di Mezzo, a historic food market with colourful stands showcasing Bologna's gastronomic culture. Grab yourself a plate of pasta and then enjoy it at one of the communal tables. Famous pasta dishes such as tortellini, tagliatelle al ragù, lasagne were all created here in Emilia-Romagna, not to mention famous meats such as mortadella and prosciutto di crudo di Parma, and the king of cheeses, parmigiano reggiano. According to legend, the creation of tortellini was inspired by the navel of Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. As the legend goes, Venus and Zeus, weary one night after a battle between Bologna and Modena, arrive at a tavern in a small town on the outskirts of Bologna. After eating a hearty dinner and getting slightly drunk, they decide to share a bedroom. The innkeeper, captivated after watching them, sneaks up to their room and peeks through the keyhole of their bedroom door. However, all he can see through the keyhole is the navel of Venus. This vision left him spellbound, so much so that he immediately rushed back to the kitchen and created a pasta inspired by Venus's navel. And so Tortellini was born. To make the most of your visit to the Quadrilatero and for an authentic local experience, I recommend joining a local food tour, which I've shared the details to in the description. To learn more about other must-try foods and famous dishes produced here in Emilia-Romagna, don't miss my food tour guide, which I've linked to in the description below. After lunch, pass under the beautiful Portici di Piazza Cavour, located on Via Ferina, considered the main entrance to the historic centre which features four rows of beautiful 18th century columns designed by the influential Baroque architect Francesco Tibaldi. Decorated with bas reliefs of historical and allegorical figures, the portico was built by Prince Ranieri Jr. on the orders of Pope Pius VI and is now home to a number of small restaurants, stores and bars. It's here you'll find dessert at Cremeria Cavour, located in Piazza Cavour, a local hotspot for some of the best gelato in the city, crafted by brothers Alessandro and Stefano since 2008, offering a variety of traditional flavours such as stracciatella, pistacchio, cioccolato and caffè. Don't miss their specialty flavours with locally inspired names such as La Dotta with mascarpone and melted chocolate or i portici with white chocolate with crispy puffed rice, or their signature flavour cavour with ricotta, amalfi lemons and pasta frolla. With your gelato in hand, head back to the piazza and grab a seat next to the statue of local legend Lucio Dalla. Born in 1943 in Bologna, Lucio Dalla was an Italian singer, songwriter, musician and actor, considered one of the most significant figures in Italian music. He gained fame for his distinctive voice and eclectic musical style, blending elements of pop, jazz and classical music. But he's best known for his hits like Caruso, a song dedicated to Italian opera tenor Enrico Caruso and L'anno che verrà. If you're a true fan, don't miss taking a stroll along Via D'Azeglio, where Lucio Dalla lived. If you don't have the time for a guided tour of his former residence, make sure you at least take a glance up at number 15, where you'll see his silhouette beautifully etched into the building's facade. Hollywood might have the Walk of Fame, but Bologna has La Strada del Jazz, Jazz Street, located at Via Caprarie. While you were busy exploring the Quadrilatero, you probably missed the gold stars dedicated to the greatest jazz players of all time. Via Caprarie, number three, used to be the location of a club owned by Alberto Alberti, manager of great artists such as Miles Davis and Chet Baker. It was here between Via Caprarie and Via degli Orefici where international jazz artists used to meet that we find these marble stars dedicated to the musicians who contributed to Bologna being later crowned UNESCO Creative City of Music in 2006. 
There is even a star dedicated to Lucio Dalla, who started off his career by playing jazz music. If you visit in September, don't miss La Strada del Jazz Festival, which fills the alleys and squares with live music. Piazza Maggiore, a name which literally translates to Major Square, has been the heart of Bologna since the 1200s, when the forward-thinking municipality developed this land into a shared space for market days and a meeting place for residents, and today it's a must-visit location for anyone exploring the city. With its charming cafes and iconic historic buildings, there's something for everyone here. Today you'll find yourself surrounded by iconic structures, such as the Basilica di San Petronio, Palazzo dei Banchi and Palazzo da Curcio. The central part of the square is characterised by a rectangular pedestrian platform 15 centimetres high, built in white and pink granite. Built in 1934, it's nicknamed Crescentone or Big Crescente, after the typical Bolognese savoury focaccia called Crescente. There's so much to see here in Piazza Maggiore, so working our way around the square, let's start with Il Palazzo del Podesta. The first building in the piazza was Il Palazzo del Podesta. This was the first site of the city government, where the mayor resided. Today, it doesn't have the same Romanesque architecture you'd expect from the 1200s, because in the 15th century, the Bentivoglio Lords commissioned architect and engineer Aristotele Fioravanti to build it in the Renaissance style. Some 7,000 flowers decorate the pillars, recalling Fioravanti's surname, which literally means flower ahead in Italian. Within the palazzo complex is a cross-arched vault, where you'll find the Voltone del Podesta, a type of whispering gallery famous for its unique acoustic effect that permits visitors to speak to each other from the opposite corners of the archway. Also here is a beam where people were hung, facing the basilica so they could repent to San Petronio before they died. Located on the east side of Piazza Maggiore, next to the basilica, is Palazzo dei Banchi. This was the last building erected in the piazza. Designed by Vignola in the 16th century, its spectacular facade was intended to hide the alleyways of the market behind it in the quadrilatero. Its name comes from the ancient presence of currency exchange, banks. To the south is the crown jewel of Piazza Maggiore, the Basilica of San Petronio. It's hard to miss the grandeur of the building where Charles V was crowned Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 1530. Originally designed to surpass St. Peter's Basilica in grandeur, Pope Pius IV halted these ambitions. It is said that the Pope had the Archiginnasio built, located next to it, as a cunning scheme to divert funds from the Basilica, ensuring it would never surpass the grandeur of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, hence its unfinished facade and exterior at the southern end. Either way, San Petronio is still one of Italy's biggest churches. Another reason why funds were diverted to establish a single location for the university, where classes were held in people's houses, was so that the clergy could walk along the corridors and eavesdrop on what was being taught and check what the professors were saying. This was particularly important since it was the time of the Counter-Reformation. Inside the basilica, you'll find a bronze statue of San Petronio, chiseled by Michelangelo Buonarroti. Also, he is the world's oldest functioning organ, built in 1470 by Lorenzo da Prato and the charming music chapel. In one of the 22 chapels of the basilica is Cappella Bolognini, or the Bolognini Chapel, home to Giovanni da Modena's impressive frescoes of heaven and hell, inspired by Dante's Divine Comedy. Last but not least, don't miss seeing the largest sundial in the world, measuring 67.27 meters. Created in 1656 by Gian Domenico Cassini, it corresponds to one 600,000th of the Earth's circumference, and to this day it marks the passing of days and seasons, with the sun's rays entering from a hole positioned in the vault 27 metres above the ground, and hitting precisely the time of year on the line. Located on the western border of Piazza Maggiore is the historic Palazzo da Curcio, a true treasure. Serving as Bologna's city government centre since 1336, whether it be the city council or the papal legates, this architectural marvel combines buildings from various centuries into one magnificent masterpiece. Named after Accursio da Bagnolo, also known as Francesco da Curcio, a renowned lawmaster who once resided here. Born in 1182, Accursio was a Tuscan jurist and glossator who moved to Bologna to teach at the university as a law professor, and had his home built in Piazza Maggiore, which also included a tower, later known as Torre da Curcio. Accursio, or Accursius in Latin, is particularly famous for his work in compiling and organising the Glossa Ordinaria, 
which was one of the most authoritative commentaries on Roman law during the Middle Ages. His contributions to legal education and jurisprudence earned him a lasting reputation as one of the most important figures in the history of European legal scholarship. Over the entrance to the building is a bronze statue of Pope Gregory XIII, and in the courtyard is a large plaque erected in November 1530 to commemorate the meetings of Charles with Pope Clement VII over a period of three months, and his coronation as emperor in 1530. Home to the papal legates for 300 years, the building includes the ceremonial Farnese Hall, formerly the Royal Hall, and the adjacent Farnese Chapel, where the emperor prepared for his coronation. Ever since 1936, the Municipal Art Collections, or Collezioni Comunali d'Arte, have been housed here. In addition to paintings dating back from the Middle Ages to the present day, the extensive collection also includes art objects, pieces of furniture, porcelain, fabrics, lace, embroidery, miniatures and important wooden crucifixes. The Sala Urbana, literally Urban Hall, dating back to 1630, is particularly prestigious. It is one of the most important examples of Baroque architecture in Bologna. Heraldic decorations and 188 coat of arms cover its walls, giving it the name Sala degli Stemmi, Coat of Arms Hall. It's also from Palazzo da Curcio that you'll get one of the best views of Piazza Maggiore and Bologna. Don't miss the Torre del Orologio, the clock tower. The tower was added to Francesco Accursio's house, and after his death, it was bought by the growing municipality of Bologna. In 1444, it was turned into a bell tower with the installation of a huge mechanical clock connected to a bell that rang every hour on the hour. From this moment on, the tower became a true point of reference for the entire city, and it not only marked the passing of time, but also represented a reference marker for the regulation of clocks all over Bologna. To visit the municipal art collections and clock tower, booking is essential. For more details, visit the description below. Adjacent to Piazza Maggiore is Piazza del Nettuno, Neptune Square, creating an extension to this already massive open space. It's here you'll find the Sala Borsa Library, Palazzo Re Enzo, and La Fontana di Nettuno, or Neptune's Fountain, that hides a cheeky secret from the unassuming viewer. But more on that later. The 13th century Palazzo Re Enzo is a medieval masterpiece. It was originally constructed to expand the city's government offices. At the time, Bologna was at the height of its glory. The city's military triumphed over the emperor's army in 1249 and even captured King Enzo of Sardinia, son of Emperor Frederick II of Swabia, who found himself residing in this lavish jail following the Battle of Falsata on the border of Modena. For 27 years, King Enzo remained a prisoner here, indulging in a luxurious lifestyle with gold chains, delicious food, and charming company. He died in this palace that today bears his name, Palazzo Re Enzo. Today it's not open to visitors as it serves mainly as a venue for cultural events, but you can catch a glimpse of its courtyard from the main entrance. Located on the opposite side of the piazza is the Sala Borsa. Originally built in the 13th century as the Bologna Stock Exchange, it served as a meeting place for merchants and traders during the Middle Ages. In Italian, sala means room and borsa means stock exchange or stock market. Today, the Sala Borsa is known primarily as the Central Public Library of Bologna. It underwent a major renovation and transformation in the early 2000s, which included the installation of transparent floors, allowing visitors to see the archaeological excavations of the ancient Roman streets and buildings that lie beneath the library. On the facade of the building is a memorial to fallen partisans who were killed during the Second World War, many of them who were killed in this piazza. Standing proudly at the centre of Piazza del Nettuno is Gian Bologna's famous Neptune fountain, commissioned by Pope Pius VI in the 16th century to showcase papal power. Can you spot Neptune's cheeky secret? 
the Pope didn't want Neptune to have large genitals, which he claimed caused a distraction towards spirituality and thus symbolizing one's inability to control their instincts. Although Giambologna agreed to keep Neptune's privates modest, he secretly incorporated a visual surprise from a certain angle. Just outside the entrance to the Sala Borsa is a grey stone on the ground, the so-called Stone of Shame. It's from here that if you look directly at Neptune, something quite surprising will catch your eye. Yep, it appears that the statue is sporting a large erection. How did he get away with this? Well, it seemed that Giambologna used some clever perspective tricks with one of Neptune's fingers to create this illusion. To learn more about Piazza Maggiore, Piazza del Nettuno, and for an in-depth exploration of Bologna's top sites in the historic center, don't miss this same walking tour I joined and recommend. For more details, visit the description below. While the Basilica of San Petronio in Piazza Maggiore may be the largest church in the city, it's actually not the cathedral. That honor belongs to San Pietro, which dates back to the 10th century. Cathedrals are larger and grander churches run by a bishop, while basilicas are churches honored by a saint or bishop. The church's crypt has a rich history that's intimately tied to the city's famous university, Alma Mater. It was here since the 13th century the university's theses were traditionally discussed, with students defending their work in front of the archdeacon of the cathedral. This fascinating tradition ended in 1798, when Napoleon nationalized Alma Mater. What's more, the Cathedral of San Pietro houses the largest bell, with over 30 quintals that can be played a la bolognese, meaning that it's played rhythmically with a complete rotation of the bell. As you explore the streets of Bologna, look out for these strange-looking large knobs. They date back to the 18th century, when doors to people's homes opened thanks to a mechanical system made up of ropes and chains. Guests could announce their arrival by pressing a knob, which made a bell placed inside the house ring, being connected to it by a rope. The servants could then open the door remotely by releasing the lock thanks to a sharp and strong pull on the chain attached to it. This gave rise to the local expression dare il tiro, which in the Bolognese dialect means to open the door. It literally means give a pull or give a tug, and it is practically unknown outside of Bologna. This term was so ingrained in local culture that even when electricity arrived, it continued to be used to indicate the classic intercom door opener. Today still in Bologna, most houses have a button in their entrance halls with the word tiro written on them, and people have maintained the custom of shouting under the porticos, Mi dai il tiro! Will you open the door? In the heart of Bologna's medieval center is the ancient Jewish ghetto that still retains much of its original structure. A maze of alleyways tell a story of an entire community that was forced to live in a confined area in many Italian cities. In 1555, Pope Paul IV ordered that ghettos be established in all territories of the Papal State. The ghetto was separated from houses outside it by specially built walls which limited access to it with just three entrance gates. The Jews of Bologna lived here until 1569, when they were expelled for the first time, and then again between 1586, when they were allowed to return to the city, and in 1593, the year of the definitive expulsion. The main road of the ghetto is Via dell'Inferno, Road of Hell. Its name suggests it was a dark and dangerous street. At number 16 on Via dell'Inferno stands the building which once housed the synagogue. This, along with persecution suffered by the Jews of Bologna, is commemorated by a plaque on the corner of the adjacent building. The synagogue was originally built during the mid-1800s, but was heavily damaged during the war. The layouts of the streets inside the ghetto are still recognizable, and information panels have been installed by the Jewish Museum of Bologna. Look out for the Hamsa, or the Hand of Fatima, a symbolic hand which represents protection in both Jewish and Islamic cultures that include a map of the area. Located around the corner from the Archiginnasio, in the heart of the Quadrilatero, is Il Portico della Morte, the Portico of Death. Named after the 15th century Ospedale della Morte, Hospital of Death, that was located here, originally to take care of prisoners sentenced to death. In 1825, the Marchesi family founded a bookshop here, which was taken over in 1928 by Arnaldo Nanni, who equipped it with the characteristic Parisian stalls. Now called Libreria Nanni, this bookshop was loved by Federico Fellini and Pierpaolo Pasolini, and it is considered a landmark of Bologna's culture. 
Located opposite Il Portico della Morte is the Church of Santa Maria della Vita, a masterpiece of Baroque architecture that was originally built in the 13th century and later reconstructed after a devastating earthquake in 1686. Its most captivating feature is Niccolò dell'Arca's 15th century Lamentation Over Dead Christ, or Compianto su Cristo Morto, consisting of life-sized terracotta figures that vividly express the sorrow and despair of Christ's followers. What's particularly impressive is the attention to detail of the anatomy of each figure. This moving depiction was so compelling that Italian poet Gabriele D'Annunzio described this work as a silent scream in stone. In contrast with the Ospedale della Morte located opposite, the Ospedale della Vita, or Hospital of the Living, was founded nearby in 1287, and this church later became the official church of the hospital. In 1801, both hospitals merged and was renamed to Ospedale Maggiore, or Major Hospital. Today, the church also houses the Museum of Health and Assistance, Museo della Sanità dell'Assistenza, which highlights the history of health in Bologna through the centuries. The park of Montagnola is one of the oldest and greenest public parks in the centre of Bologna. It's located on an artificial plateau formed by the accumulation of debris from the nearby 14th century Galliera Castle. This castle had been built to house the Pope and his court and was later destroyed by mobs. The park first opened in the 17th century and was the site of the Battle of Montagnola on the 8th of August 1848, in which Italian revolutionaries from Bologna defeated and temporarily expelled the Austrians. The park has a number of 19th and early 20th century sculptures and is used for various events. Located on the opposite side of the strip of Via dell'Indipendenza is Porta Galliera, one of the medieval city gates to the city of Bologna. From here, the road led to Ferrara. Located in Piazza Santo Stefano is the Church of Santo Stefano, a fascinating architectural collage of various structures assembled over time. While the origins of the Santo Stefano complex are controversial and disputed, the most commonly accepted theory was that it was built by Petronius on the ruins of a pre-existing Roman temple and spring, dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Isis. It is said that in the 5th century, Petronius, the city's bishop at the time, was so moved by his trip to the Holy Land that he decided to recreate a replica of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. But don't expect your average church, it's actually a complex of seven sacred buildings, each built at a different time to symbolize a phase of Christ's passion, and fondly known as Sette Chiese, Seven Churches. Today it is considered one of the best things to do in Bologna and a must-see attraction. From the piazza, you can see three churches. On the left is Sant Vitale and Agricola, the oldest church in Bologna, dedicated to two local saints martyred in 304. Then behind the tree is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Petronius reconsecrated the spring here, which now represents the water of the River Jordan. At the center is the Crocifisso Church, also known as the Church of San Giovanni Battista, or St. John the Baptist, which probably has origins that date back to the Longobards era in the 8th century and was later rebuilt in the 12th century. Its doorway serves as the entrance to the complex. To the right is the Celestine Benedictine Convent, established here in 1493 by Pope Julius II. But that's not all. The Basilica is also home to the world's oldest nativity scene, Made of lime and elm wood and boasting life-size figures, this breathtaking work of art dates back to 1200 and is truly a sight to behold. On the opposite side of Piazza Santo Stefano in Strada Maggiore is an excellent example of a 13th century house in Bologna. Its oak beams of the arcade reach 29 feet, some 9 meters in height, to support the third floor of the building. It's also the site of several local legends surrounding three arrows stuck in the bottom of the third floor. As one story goes, a husband suspecting his wife was cheating on him ordered three archers to kill her. However, when the archers were preparing to take their shot, the woman noticed them and exposed herself. The men were so shocked that they missed their target and shot the three arrows into the vault of the arcade. To find the arrows, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack as they are thin and very well camouflaged by the wooden planks. If you want to immerse yourself in the marvels of this ancient structure, you can even reserve a room at the cozy bed and breakfast located inside. To find out more and to book your stay, use the link in the description below. It may be hard to imagine, but Bologna was once a bustling centre of canals and waterways and even had its own port. 
But how was this possible? The only natural source of water in Bologna is more like a creek. The Torrente Apposa is just 7,500 metres long and it originates in the hills, emptying into the Canale Navile. So where are all these canals? With the influx of students arriving to Bologna to study at the university, its fast-growing population needed more water. So the ingenious residents designed a complex network of canals drawing from the Reno and Savena rivers to bring water to the city. The excavation of the Reno and Savena canals proved to be a significant boost for the city's economy. They powered grain mills and artisanal workshops and fueled a population surge that saw Bologna grow to become the fifth largest city in Europe with a bustling community of 60,000 residents. Thanks to the state-of-the-art hydraulic power supply system, Bologna became a prominent hub in the Italian and European textile industry in the centuries to come. The city's exquisite Bolognese-style silk was highly coveted, contributing to its reputation as a key play in the textile industry. Just like Florence flourished thanks to access to the River Arno for its wool production, Bologna became the capital of silk production. While also providing water to residents, the waterways powered mills and factories for silk production and were used to export their goods. There were some 40 miles of exposed canals in the city, which were only covered over last century. Today, the only spot in the city where you can still see evidence of these waterways is at Finestrella di Via Piella, the window in Via Piella, also called La Piccola Venezia, Little Venice. It's here that you get a glimpse of the Moline Canal. All these canals made the earth less stable, causing many towers to lean, sink and turn because of the water flowing underneath the city. Today, these canals still exist below street level and are used to create green energy, thanks to the difference in the water level, which can reach up to 16 metres. If exploring museums is your thing, the city of Bologna and the region of Emilia-Romagna won't let you down. This corner of the country is packed with numerous important galleries and museums, covering a variety of topics. Learn about Bologna's Etruscan roots, see one of the only three works signed by Giotto, and climb the tower that Copernicus used to stargaze, and discover the region's famous motor valley, where you can take a private factory tour of each of the legendary automotive brands, including Ferrari, Lamborghini, Ducati, and Maserati. You won't want to miss these unique experiences. So let's start by exploring Museo di Palazzo Poggi. Located inside the heart of the University of Bologna is the Museum of Palazzo Poggi, built as the home of Alessandro Poggi and his brother, the future Cardinal Giovanni Pioggio, also written Poggi. The building was erected between 1549 and 1560, which is how it gets its name. Starting from 1711, a great part of the laboratories of the Instituto della Scienza, or the Institute of Sciences, were moved to the Piano Nobile, or the Noble Floor where the museum is currently located, and since 1803 has been the headquarters of the university. The museum is home to a fascinating treasure trove that any curious soul would enjoy exploring, with the variety of collections that showcase the university's rich scientific heritage from centuries past. You can discover ancient physics, natural history, chemistry, geography, boating, and intriguing anatomical waxes that were once used by the university for training. Not to be missed is the Tower Observatory, La Specola, Built between 1712 and 1725, it was the first university observatory in Italy. Now called Museo della Specola, it is divided into several rooms, including the Meridian Room, the Globe Room and the Tourette Room, that showcase a variety of instruments that were used by astronomers in the past. At the top of the tower there is a terrace with an extraordinary 360 panoramic view of the city of Bologna. It was here that Copernicus once observed the stars. Access to La Specola is by private tour only. To find out more, visit the details in the description below. Overlooking Bologna from 300 metres high on Colle della Guardia is the Santuario della Bieta Vergine di San Luca, the sanctuary of the Madonna of San Luca, a revered religious site dedicated to the Virgin Mary and home to a venerated Byzantine icon. Dating back to the 18th century, the sanctuary is linked to the city centre by the picturesque Portico di San Luca, the world's largest portico with 666 arches. Together with all other porticos of this city, it was included in the UNESCO World Heritage Site list in 2021. 
The porticos provide shelter for the traditional procession, which every year since 1433 has carried a Byzantine icon of the Madonna and Child, attributed to Luke the Evangelist, down to the Bologna Cathedral during the Feast of the Ascension. This stunning pathway offers a peaceful pilgrimage route with panoramic views of Bologna's beautiful landscape. Many locals make this their daily exercise, a route that starts at Porta Saragozza, one of the 12 gates of the ancient walls built in the Middle Ages, and unwinds for about 4 kilometers. If you don't want to take the 8 kilometer or 5 mile return route, you can jump on the San Luca Express, which departs from Piazza Maggiore, which will take you to the top of the sanctuary. After you explore the area, you can either walk back down, which I personally recommend, or jump on the next train back down. Tickets for the train can be purchased on site in Piazza Maggiore. For music enthusiasts, the Museo Internazionale e Biblioteca della Musica, or the International Museum and Library of Music, is a treasure trove in Bologna. Located within the stunning Palazzo Sanguinetti, the museum has an esteemed collection of printed music from the 16th to the 18th centuries along with a remarkable assortment of musical instruments and artworks that trace the evolution of music over time. The museum also has a meticulously recreated workshop of the renowned Bolognese Luthier, Otello Bignami, providing an intriguing glimpse into his craftsmanship. The original core of the museum's musical collections is credited to the Franciscan friar Giovanni Battista Martini, born in Bologna in 1706. Martini was a music scholar and collector, a theorist and composer, and a teacher of counterpoint. Johann Christian Bach and Wolfgang Amadei Mozart were among his students. When Mozart was only 14, he was admitted to the Philharmonica Academy, thanks to the sponsorship of Martini. The palace walls, covered in vivid frescoes that were first completed between the 18th and early 19th centuries, provide one of the finest examples of neoclassical decoration. The Church of San Colombano, established in 616 and no longer in use, is famous among music enthusiasts for its rare and exquisite collection of instruments from various Italian and European schools. Ancient harpsichords, organs, clavichords, spinets, pianos and other folk and wind instruments can be found here at Museo San Colombano, Collezione Tagliavini. The collection, consisting of approximately 70 beautifully restored instruments, are all in impeccable working condition and come to life during concerts. The collection's history began in 1969 when Maestro Tagliavini purchased a 16th century spinet he found in Bologna, followed by the Grand Three Register harpsichord built in 1679 by Giovanni Battista Giusti of Luca. It is still considered one of the most important pieces in the collection. In addition to the instrument collection, the complex also features a specialised library belonging to Oscar Mischiati, a renowned musicologist from Bologna, and the Oratory of San Colombano, which boasts a stunning cycle of frescoes. The Museo Civico Archeologico, or the Archaeological Civic Museum, one of Bologna's most prestigious museums, is located in the beautiful 15th century Palazzo Galvani in Piazza Galvani. Open to the public in 1881, the museum provides a delightful escape into ancient history and is mostly known for its Egyptian collection, the third largest in Italy and among the most important in Europe. Its Roman, Greek and Etruscan italic sections are also impressive, with the latter consisting the most important part of the museum and documents the development of Falsina. Also of note is that the apse in the museum's entrance hall is the only surviving structure of the old Ospedale della Morte, which we learned about earlier. In a city as charmingly medieval as Bologna, it's only fitting to have a museum that pays homage to this fascinating era. The Museo Medievale, or the Civic Medieval Museum, showcases a remarkable collection of ancient artefacts, paintings, sculptures and manuscripts that allow you to delve into the daily lives of the people who once walked along these cobblestone streets. Additionally, the museum features Gian Bologna's preliminary study for the iconic Fountain of Neptune, completed in 1564 and praised by Pope Pius IV. The museum is housed in Palazzo Ghisilardi, one of the finest examples of Renaissance architecture in Bologna that was built for the notary and chancellor Bartolomeo Ghisilardi between 1484 and 1491 and it is located in the ancient area of the Roman Forum. The Basilica of San Domenico, one of Bologna's most opulent churches, overflows with artistic history and marvels. 
constructed by the Dominican friars to enshrine their founder, San Domenico di Guzman, who came to Bologna in the 13th century. The church also has a bell tower erected in 1313 in Gothic style and stands 51 meters high. The basilica houses numerous invaluable artworks. Among these are three statues by Michelangelo and the exquisitely ornamented ark containing the saint's remains. The basilica also features the organ on which a young Mozart practiced during his time in Bologna while he was studying with Father Giovanni Battista Martini. On the 6th of October 1770, for the Feast of the Madonna del Rosario, Mozart performed on the organ of this chapel when he was just over 14. It was then on October 9th that Mozart took the musical composition exam, but his work was a little lacking, or perhaps it was judged too modern, and Maestro Martini intervened by making corrections because the test was acceptable. As a result, on the 10th of October, the young Mozart was officially enrolled with the title of composer at the prestigious and century-old Philharmonic Academy of Bologna. In addition to the song reported in Latin, we see the signature of the young Mozart who Italianized his name, Amadeo Wolfgango. The Pinoteca Nazionale, or the Bologna National Gallery, is situated in the old university complex and showcases an impressive collection of nearly 1,000 artworks that celebrate this city's artistic heritage. The paintings date from the 13th to the 18th century and include works by both local painters and renowned Italian artists such as Raffaele, Titian, Parmigianino, Guido Reni, Giotto and Giorgio Vasari. Of particular mention is this piece painted by Giotto and his workshop, the undisputed protagonist of 14th century Italian art. This is one of only three works that was signed by the artist. Now let's explore La Terra dei Motori, Motor Valley, the heart of Italian automotive and motorcycle industries that were born and still have their headquarters here, including Ferrari, Maserati, Pagani, Lamborghini and Ducati. So let's start our tour with Ducati. Established in 1926 as a manufacturer of radios and adding machines, Ducati has grown to become the most prominent motorcycle brand in Italy. Located 30 minutes by bus just outside the historical centre of Bologna, their factory headquarters houses the Ducati Museum, which exhibits the evolution of Ducati motorcycles. The collection features legendary models, rare prototypes and limited editions. Additionally, you can enjoy an immersive experience with interactive displays and a virtual reality room. Of course, the real highlight is their factory tour, where you can see passionate engineers meticulously piecing together 15 to 1600 parts that make up a typical Ducati motorcycle. During the high season, they produce some 400 motorcycles each day, which are pieced together by 750 staff. During the low season, there are 500 members of staff who produce 150. During the tour, a guide will show you where and how the bikes are conceived. They pass through the mechanical processing department where the timing systems and crankshafts are prepared in a continuous cycle. The engineer assembly area where the new V8 engine assembly line is located and then on to the vehicle assembly lines up to the testing and shipping area. To join the factory tour, booking is essential. For more details, visit the link in the description below. Just half an hour by train from Bologna is the Maserati showroom and factory, located in Modena. It's here you can take a fascinating factory tour. Lasting an hour, you'll be guided through the large complex by a knowledgeable guide, where you'll see the production line of the MC20, the Maserati engine lab and the paint shop, while also learning about the brand's history and other fun facts about Maserati and its beautiful cars. The Maserati Engine Lab consists of five separate areas, the assembly shop, testing room, the workshop where the engine is mounted in the car, emission roller beds and production. On top of the showroom is the headquarters with some 220 staff members. In the factory are 200 more staff members who work on the MC20 production and 90 who work in the experimental area. The average age of a staff member at Maserati is 45 years old, with the average career lasting 26 years. While today Maserati is made in Modena, it was founded in Bologna. Its logo featuring the Trident was designed by one of the Maserati brothers, Mario, the only one of the brothers who was passionate about art, while the other brothers were all passionate about cars, speed and engineering. 
Mario Maserati was inspired by one of Bologna's most famous symbols, the Fountain of Neptune, which depicts the god of the seas with his signature trident. Mario designed the Maserati logo to include this powerful icon, which symbolizes mastery over the water's raw power. The trident also happens to be an upside-down M for Maserati. To join the factory tour, booking is essential. For more details, visit the link in the description below. Located halfway between Bologna and Modena, or a 40-minute bus ride from Bologna, is the Lamborghini Museum, where you'll see a collection of iconic Lamborghini models on display, showcasing the evolution of unparalleled design and engineering prowess. What started as a tractor-building activity evolved into an iconic brand symbol of made-in-Italy design and style. As you step inside, you'll be transported through a fascinating journey of the first 350 GT to the latest cutting edge, Urican, a Spanish word meaning hurricane, along with multimedia installations and exclusive memorabilia. The real drawcard here is their factory tour, which is excellent. Strictly no phones or personal items are allowed inside, so I couldn't even take notes. Everything must be kept in a free on-site locker. As always, booking is essential as spaces are limited. For more details, visit the link in the description below. If you're a fan of Ferrari, then you'll be spoiled with not just one, but three locations where you can take a deep dive into the extraordinary history of the prancing horse. Start your journey in Modena at the Museo Casa Enzo Ferrari, or the Enzo Ferrari Museum, which focuses on the life and work of Enzo Ferrari, the founder of Ferrari. The museum complex includes two separate buildings, a former house and workshop that belonged to Enzo Ferrari's father, and a huge modern building spanning 6,000 square meters, or 65,000 square feet, with a permanent exhibition displaying some of the most noteworthy Ferrari automobiles, including rare cars from the 1950s, Formula One race cars, and more recent sports cars. Outside the museum, you can jump on a courtesy Ferrari bus to the Ferrari Museum in Maranello, the home of Ferrari, located just outside of Modena. From here, you take a trip through a captivating history of this iconic brand, with unforgettable cars on display, engaging exhibits, bringing you into the thrilling world of Formula One. The museum is not purely for cars. There are also trophies, photographs, and other historical objects relating to the Italian motor racing industry. You can even take a Ferrari for a test drive with one of their two driving simulators set in real F1 cars. Located just 300 meters away from the museum is the Ferrari factory, where the museum offers several experiences, such as guided tours and private tours, personalized experiences, or a scenic panoramic tour by shuttle inside the Fiorano track and along the Viale Enzo Ferrari Boulevard in the factory complex. Unfortunately, factory visits are only available to clients and F1 sponsors, so joining the panoramic tour is as close as you'll get to behind the scenes. Once on the bus, a museum guide will discuss the various characteristics of the Ferrari track, where the prancing horse has carried out all of its competition and road car tests since 1972, and you'll see the Ferrari campus, the heart of the complex, where all the prancing horse cars are built. There are some 3,500 workers in the factory and 1,000 staff in the offices, for a total of 4,500 members of staff on site, 70% of which are female. On the tour, you'll also pass Il Cavallino, which was Enzo Ferrari's favorite restaurant. You'll also learn about the fascinating story behind the Ferrari logo. That canary yellow of the background is actually the color of Modena, a tribute to Enzo Ferrari's hometown. The black horse was originally a symbol of Count Francesco Baracca, who was a legendary Italian Air Force ace during World War I, who painted it on the side of every plane he flew. He was unfortunately shot down in 1918. In 1923, Enzo Ferrari won an opportunity to meet Count Enrico Baracca and Countess Paulina Baracca in person, after winning a race at the Savio Circuit in Ravenna. And it was there that the Countess suggested that Enzo should brand his vehicles with the prancing horse for good luck. And finally, the letters S and F that you see on early versions of the Ferrari logo and on the modern Shield versions stand for Scuderia Ferrari, literally Ferrari stables. Again, no photography is allowed on the panoramic tour while you're inside the Ferrari complex. To join the panoramic tour, booking is essential as spaces are limited. For more details, visit the link in the description below. 
If you're interested in visiting multiple factories but don't want the hassle of organising transportation to these various locations, you can join a private guided tour which includes a visit to the Ferrari Museum in Maranello, the Ducati Museum and Factory and the Lamborghini Museum and Factory. For more details, visit the link in the description below. Got a trip coming up or want to communicate with your Italian relatives or partner? Now you can learn Italian with my unique 80-20 method. Just click on the link in the description below and check out my online video language courses that will help you become conversational in Italian and learn anywhere, anytime and on any device. So there we have it. This is my guide on some of the best things to do in Bologna. If you have any questions, just pop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you. And don't forget to find links to my Bologna travel guide and links to all the tours I've mentioned in this video below in the description. In the meantime, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel and turn on those notifications so you get an alert when I post more videos like this one. Until next time, thanks for watching. Buon viaggio. Ciao.